Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me to uh, give this uh, talk. Uh, it's my first time at the Open Recorded in Amsterdam, so I'm very excited about that too. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled with the trust that you give me to uh, take a whole hour of, of this uh, morning uh, to talk about my experiences uh, in approaching improvisation. <coughs> and so I thought uh, I'd talk about how I uh, see about improvisation, what is my motivation for improvising as a performer, and also for having my students improvise or encouraging them to do so. And uh, the two key words for me, at least today, are on the screen. I think improvisation is a lot about empowerment, giving the students or yourself the power to act, the power to do something. And for me, that happens largely when I manage to have an explorational approach, when I explore the material rather than, let's say, execute it. Uh, I'll come back to that, of course. But so that you know from where I am speaking, I thought also I might uh, say a little bit about my background and play a some very short examples of uh, yeah, snippets of music where I'm somehow improvising. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, so this is the just come on. It's the unimportant part where I talk about myself. Uh, I'll get to the important start the part afterwards. Good morning. Come in. Good morning again to those who just arrived. Uh, I was just about to uh, say something about myself so that you know from where, from where I'm speaking when I'm talking about improvisation. First of all, I never received any education in improvisation because it, there was no course in any of the schools where I uh, studied. So we had, uh, as I suspect many of us will have had some, uh, let's say, one day or two day workshops in free improvisation. Uh, and they tend to sound the same everywhere. Uh, and uh, then later I started to get um, interested in improvisation through early music, uh, playing uh, diminutions by Bassano or uh, Ortiz. I found out that it would be fun to make my own. And then while writing your own, you figure out that it's kind of boring to write so many notes. It's much quicker to just play them. So you stop writing everything and then you write less and less and all of a sudden you're just making them up as you go. Uh, and then uh, I made a, a bigger project out of that, Diminutions uh, in Polyphonic Music. Later I received the possibility of teaching in Leipzig in the historical or early music department in historical improvisation, which I still do. I'm there three times a semester. But my main position is in Bergen in Norway, uh, where I teach uh, a number of things. And sometimes I get to teach genre open improvisation. And uh, that means I'm meeting musicians from, some of them from early music, but very few. Most of them are from the uh, classical department. We also have a jazz department, and at least one third of the students usually are from there. And we have uh, sometimes music therapists that have maybe more background in popular music. And so I have to make up a structure that works for all of them. And that structure is kind of the basis for what I would like to share with you today. Uh, so I don't uh, share with you today information on how to do things in an early music style, uh, although there will be some examples of how that might work in a more open uh, session with musicians from many areas. So uh, just again, so that you know what kind of music I'm making, I thought I'd play like two minutes of music, uh, plus the time I need to get between the music pieces, uh, where improvisation played a part. Uh, I might not be referring too much to it later, but if you have questions, you can post them, of course. And that goes for my whole presentation. If there's something that's unclear, just ask. 
So first, uh, here an example of uh, trying to improvise a polyphony in a late medieval style as an ensemble. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I try to improvise suites in a baroque style on a bass that we choose and here's uh, the beginning of an allemande on the famous <coughs> bass uh, of the Goldberg Variations adapted for the occasion. I meet with a close colleague of mine in the office and we just sit down and play for a while uh, without talking about it and uh, all kinds of stuff come out. I'm going to leave my uh, presentation and go to SoundCloud. but the whole composition was based on uh, workshops with improvisation to see what musicians could do in the context. And the notation was also kind of loose. Uh, so improvisation was also a part here. So this was the last example. So um, why do I improvise? Uh, and why do I teach improvisation? I mentioned it already. Um, it's, for me, it's about empowerment. And I'm, what I'm not going to try to do today is define improvisation uh, because there are, it's, it's difficult enough. It's a tricky matter. Uh, some of you might have read some papers or articles or uh, encyclopedia entries about improvisation, and they are not always so helpful for a practitioner. For example, the Oxford New uh, Dictionary says about improvisation, it is to create and perform music, drama or verse spontaneously without preparation. And 
I think I never prepare more than when I have to do something with improvisation. Uh, so it kind of doesn't help me at all. Uh, and musicians also have very different notions, I think, of what counts as improvisation and what would be, let's say, composition without paper, uh, memorization, or um, what would be to choose from a stock of repertoire. Uh, so I'm not going to try to say what improvisation is either. Uh, but for me, the motivation is to feel empowered, to be flexible, uh, to express myself, uh, to shape and move the music that I'm, that I'm playing, uh, and to define it through its negative. The opposite of improvisation for me is what is reflected in Stravinsky's view upon the executing musician. He doesn't want the musician to interfere in, in his famous uh, <coughs> essays. He wants the musician to not be think even that he's an interpreter uh, that adds anything. He just wants him to execute the score. Uh, so that's where I'm not. I want to explore the score and I want to explore sonorities and that can happen in a number of ways. <coughs> and that's important also <coughs> if, if uh, improvisation is about empowerment and about exploration, then it's a bit of a tricky thing to deal with in uh, education because we are quite used to instructing when we teach. So how can you instruct someone and at the same time give them the power to explore? Whereas the uh, equilibrium between, let's say, opening up and instructing. So again, the ability to do something, the power to act, is for me the, the, the crucial issue. And what is it that we are <coughs> acting with? So what is our material? I think many of many here, since we are all recorded players, might have seen the, the video with Hans Brichen uh, documenting the preparations for and ultimately the concert which proved to be his last performance in public. Anyone seen it? It's on YouTube. And uh, so in one of the rehearsals, he interrupts the orchestra and reminds them that the most important or the elements of music is rhythm, melody and harmony. And then he says, and rhythm is by far the most important. Very well uh, put, in a way. Uh, and it's easy to agree. But then I think, I think we are all teachers. Did you ever have a student receiving its first recorder and say, ooh, cool, I can play all kinds of rhythms on it. No, uh, and you also don't come home with a sub bass recorder saying, oh, I can play so many harmonies. Or, you know, wow, I can play all these melodies. It, that's not the fascination, that's not why we choose to play an instrument or why we get fascinated by an instrument we don't play, but which is in the room. <coughs> The main reason is just the sound of the instrument itself. That's my suspicion. It certainly was for me, and it still is. If I'm fascinated by the sound, if I feel I can do something with it, then I would like to do it more. And also, if you go to a concert, if I take my son to a concert, we will not be talking about the rhythm when we come home, unless it's a very rhythmical piece. We will talk about that enormous instrument, which was in the back playing very low notes. So we will talk about the very loud instrument, we will be talking about dynamics, register maybe, he will not call it that, but we will talk about visual appearance and the timbre of things, you know. The extreme vibrato of the fat lady in the back uh, of the choir, you know, these kinds of things, that's what we're talking about. And uh, I also think uh, of all, like someone like Franz Bregin would definitely acknowledge the importance of uh, not only rhythm, melody, and harmony, but also timbre or sound, because if there's something he contributed with, it was not revamping harmony, but it was defining sound. He was defining a new sound through changing uh, his tools, the instruments, and the technologies, the playing techniques, and to a certain degree, of course, the material in, in sense of repertoire. They would find new repertoire that encouraged new sounds. But what we're left with is the, a new soundscape, so this is for me very, very important. And I find uh, support in that with Helmut Lachenmann. Is that a name that's known to you? He's a quite famous composer and uh, 
Klangtypen der neuen Musik ist, I think, a referential um, essay uh, for composers at least. And he defines sound as, or the four main parameters of sound to be Tonhöhe, so pitch, Klangfarbe, which is then timbre, Lautstärke, which would be dynamics, and Dauer, which is duration. And if you look, you can see that rhythm is kind of in there already with duration. Melody could be the tone here, and harmony, in fact, also, because harmony is a constellation of pitches. So this could also be our material. So let's consider this materials. Materials that we work with as performers or teachers, and that we can have the power to act with. But then I also mentioned that Franz Bruggen, uh, to be able to change the sound, he swapped out, like many others in, in the early music movement, they changed the musical instruments, and I consider them tools. There are many kinds of tools, and musical instruments is certainly one of them. The body could be a tool. Uh, and technology, and when I say technology, I mean in a very extended sense, so not necessarily something which needs an electric cable, but the way we do things. So me talking now is a kind of a technology for speaking. I get to stand and you get to sit. But if I stand afterwards when someone else is giving a talk, it would be very strange. So it's a technology that works for this situation. Hello, good morning. Uh, before I continue with this, I would like to go quickly to a model which I learned some 20 years back when I was studying pedagogy. Keith Swanwick, I don't know if that's a, a well-known name to you, but it was on my curriculum when I studied uh, pedagogy. And uh, he suggested that learning co goes through a process of experimentation or assimilation and accommoda accommodation of materials first, then expression, so the expressive power of the materials or, or capacity or qualities before we then slowly are able to uh, set them into some kind of form and finally um, some kind of added value through newly organized music materials or new music materials. And then you can expect that he will go back again somehow to materials. So when I started to teach uh, improvisation, genre open improvisation in Bergen, I remember this model and thought maybe that can help me. So maybe I can organize my teaching <coughs> according to <coughs> materials, expression, and form, and value. But then I felt maybe something is lacking because I don't have the tools and technologies here. And also, I need kind of, for me, a category which I call textures. So textures, I will come back to all of this, but textures is for me the way you combine the materials. Uh, but now I look at this and then I'm breaking one of my few important rules when I deal with improvisation. And the, a very important rule is that you need to be able to remember everything by heart easily. So the framework, I mean. If I can't remember the framework, how will I work with it? And this is for me too big a framework. Uh, I want my students also to be able to recall whatever was on the whiteboard. I don't want to give them a 20-page handout because then it becomes instruction and not door openers where they can explore themselves. So I took tools and technologies into materials. And then, just for ease, and then I removed value because <coughs> I think it's too early to think about the value of improvisation while you're improvising. So that can be a task for later. Now, what is materials? Materials can be a lot, and a point for me here that it's, I, I don't like to think of materials as melody, rhythm, and harmony. They are there, but as I said, uh, there is a lot of else going on, and there are many entry points for starting to improvise. And I prefer many times to just start with the instruments uh, including the bodies of those who are present in the room, because usually they know much more about it than me, especially if it's not a recorded class, but an open genre uh, 
improvisation class. So if you're a bassoon player, I cannot teach you how to play the bassoon. So if I ask you, what can you do on your bassoon? At, I think at least I'm giving the power to the bassoon player instead of saying, you should play this harmony on your bassoon, you know. And so we start to explore dynamics, timbre, etc. And here we can start making lists if we like to. So when I teach, I usually have, I write this on a whiteboard always. I never do PowerPoints when I teach the improvisation. And then we start to look for things we can do. What can you do with your playing techniques? For example, oscillations. I like the term oscillations. Um, and we have many kinds of, let's say, bodily oscillations. For example, vibrato, it's an oscillation that starts in the body. So what kind of vibratos can you do? Um, what kind of articulations or what kind of trills can you do that creates oscillations also, sonorous <coughs> oscillations? Uh, what kind of articulations can you do? That's kind of two categories for me here. It's one that does not create oscillations but attack, and another one which could create oscillations. Um, and I do this for, for several reasons, and one is that... Can you yeah. just read out what's on the bottom? Yes, I can't, it's certainly. Quite this one or all of it? The, the lowest one. Here it says articulations, and it says consonants, oh. slap tone, yeah. sputato, lip effects. But when I do this with the students, I don't, I don't give them the list. We make the list together. And usually uh, they remind me of stuff I don't know or I don't remember in the moment, that's become important then. Um, so afterwards, I will make this invisible, so you can make the list yourself. Uh, but uh, one very interesting thing with making this list is that when a student kind of remembers what he or she can do, the things that they don't say is very interesting as well, because usually they don't use these things. So if I ask a recorded student, okay, what kind of vibrato can you, can you make? Usually they will go like, oh, well, you know, with a belly vibrato, and then they know they can do it in the throat, but depending on the teacher, uh, they would uh, not like it very much. I think it's wrong. Uh, in an open genre improvisation, no vibrato is wrong. So, but none, I, I never met a student, record a student who mentioned tongue vibrato as a possibility, especially in early music departments. We, we kind of don't think about the things that are not conform in the early music department. So lip vibrato or, yeah, the same with drilling with, with more than one finger. Yeah, I brought a recorder if this. Uh, I can show it later if there's time. Um, so anyways, it's a way of discovering what the student already knows, and it's a way of saying to the student, well, what if you try to make the vibrato with your tongue? What happens then? And then they explore, instead of me telling them how to do it. And it's a lot of fun, too. So much for materials. I'm not going to categorize it further because, uh, and I also wouldn't do it in the lesson because it becomes instructional if I give them a huge list and then they feel that they have to learn it instead of just exploring it for themselves. And also, if they want huge lists, there are lists to be found. You all know Susanne Fröhlich, uh, I hope. She finished her artistic PhD in Graz earlier this year and uh, she, one of the things she did was to uh, describe playing techniques on the recorder, and if you go to her homepage, you can find her categorizations and a long list of things you can do. And apparently it's only a preview, so I guess there is more coming. I'd like to move to, oh yeah, and also I could mention again Helmut Lachenmann. Uh, if you want something less recorder specific, uh, he has these categories we already saw, the parameters of sound, but then he also works on Klang typen, kinds of sound, where he mentions Kadenzklang, Fahrtklang, Fluktuationsklang, Texturklang, Strukturklang, etc. Very interesting stuff, uh, made for composers, but it's absolutely fascinating for recorder players as well. And when he talks about Strukturklang or Texturklang, then we are already entering, for me, my next category, which is textures. What kind of textures can we make when we improvise? Uh, and this becomes very obvious when you have two or more players. Then you start to combine materials. And here, also when I te teach Shanghai Open, I draw a lot upon what I know from early music. And very frequently, I start with imitation in, in its strictest form, canon, 
which could be, it might seem a little bit uh, con counterproductive if I want to empower the student because it's basically rules. Uh, but I'll tell you why. In what we like to call free improvisation or genre open improvisation, if there's one thing that always happens, it's imitation. Someone plays a motive, someone else picks it up, it always happens. So in a way, it's something we can culture, it's something we can, can uh, practice doing. And a very effective way of practicing it is to play what I would call a pitch canon. I usually use uh, Renaissance models, uh, and if you need, like, I don't give you the formula today, I can do it in a break if you like, but Barnabé Chana, Chanté sur le livre, uh, has the rules for canon at the octave, at the fifth, at the fourth, below all of uh, how to make a cadence, etc. So, I usually have them play for a short while, not a very long while, canons. And the thing that they discover very quickly, I don't have to tell it to them, uh, is that if I want Sarah to copy what I'm playing, I can't play an awful lot. The more I play, the more difficult life is for you. See, if I want to put something, something out there that I want my fellow musicians to pick up and use, I have to play very little, and I have to leave space. What I can do with Sarah is playing something which is a little bit complex, but then I leave space for you to copy it while I play something very simple, for example. So it's a, you learn that imitation is also a process of feeding, waiting, feeding, waiting. So after playing pitch canons, and in an open genre improvisation, we do it for a quite short while, you can play a different kind of canon. You can play a dynamics canon. You can play a timbre canon. You can play an oscillation canon. You can play canon on anything. And the task is always dif difficult. If you want someone to copy your oscillations, let's say, well, then you have to be consequent for a while, give someone the opportunity to copy, and then uh, continue with your output. Another thing which uh, is quite usual is to think of some kind of foreground and background. So someone is in the foreground playing maybe more actively and someone is in the background playing less actively. Uh, this I use also in early music improvisation and it's a very good place to start to be empowered, to feel that you can do things. Uh, whenever I do, I think absolutely every time I did a workshop in early music improvisation, I started with a musette. Because the great thing about the musette is that the background is not going anywhere. And so if you just play a drum, and someone plays a melody on the drum, everything sounds great. So you don't feel stupid. If you start with moving around with harmonies, then you, people try to keep track of the harmonies, and they're not really exploring anything, they're just trying to keep track of what's happening. If you just say, okay, this is the background, play something on top of it, everyone is happy. Now, if you can play a, a tonal musette, you can also play a, a shimmering mosaic. You just tell the group, okay, make some kind of shimmering background, and you play a solo on top of that and use whatever material you would like. And it also usually sounds quite good, and it leaves the soloist um, time and space to explore. So I have had a lot of uh, positive experiences with a background or a ground which is not going anywhere. <coughs> But, of course, at some point, everyone wants the background to be flexible as well and move somewhere. In early music, that could be a cantus firmus. So, one note at a time, in a slow tempo, leaving the soloist, let's say, time to invent something on top of that note. One very good entry into that could be to do it non-measured. I think I wrote it, yeah, kind of recitative style. So, instead of me playing, you know, a cantus firmus, where you have to keep my rhythm, I can just say, I'll play that first note until you're finished, and then you give me the signal when you want to change to the second one. And this is a bit similar to, did I write it anywhere? No. But if you know uh, Notre Dame organum, so do you have uh, a plain chant, which is sung so slow that you, have, you can have a minute for each note if you like, and then whoever is a soloist explores all the possibilities of that note, and when that soloist is ready to move on, he gives a sign, and you move on. Uh, 
And that can also work with causal progressions. And if you can, like anything you can do with tonal material, you can also do with a non-tonal material. So if I can have a cantus firmus la spagna on pages, I can also say, let's make the cantus firmus feeling where you make uh, a cantus firmus consisting of, let's say, different oscillations. A trill on this note or a kind of a heavy vibrato or a shimmering, any kind of oscillation. And then when the other one is ready, he gives you a sign, you move to a different kind of oscillation. And then that person who is there on top makes a new fantasy on top of your new oscillation, for example. Um, so that principle works very well for me. Another principle that helps a lot, I didn't write it here, but it's just a, a kind of th thing I've experienced, is that if I use chordal progressions, once I start them to, to move them rhythmically, which is something we definitely would like to try at some point, to avoid that the student is trying to keep track of what is happening and not exploring it, uh, I use a trick I learned by Thomas Boyson, who is a lute player. The student only gets to play one note. So your whole solo must be one pitch, if you are in early music then. Uh, which means the student not only gets to, but has to explore parameters of the playing that he or she knows better than I. So you have to go into dynamics and rhythms and, and timbre. Uh, what can you do with only one note? And which also means that Notes that don't fit the harmony, if you are in a harmonic uh, tonal improvisation, they are nowhere, you don't feel any blame for something not fitting, but because you don't get to go away from that note for the moment. After one round, you expand two notes. Okay, if we are in D minor, the first round you play only D. Second round, you get to play C sharp if you want to. Third round, you can add another note, C sharp, D, E. And then you keep expanding little by little, and if you don't do this, what usually happens in my classes is that the students are all over the place immediately, burning all their gunpowder <coughs> within 20 seconds. I usually do it myself. So it's also fun as an artistic strategy, just limit yourself a lot. Now again, if you can do this with a tonal material, you can do it with a non-tonal or experimental material or whatever. Yes? Sorry, can I just ask, so does that mean um, they keep the notes for the entire ground or any length? Uh, any length, so you have to experiment with anything except pitch. You lock pitch. Uh, so if, if, let's say, you play La Folia uh, and you play the chords, I only, and we are in D minor, I only get to play D. But I play the D in any way I like. So then you have to start to work with rhythm. I do it also when I early, work on early music and diminutions, that I often start with the categories of Ganassi and others who, who have diminutions on only one note. So you don't feel like you have to walk a long way. You start to become interested in rhythm instead. Uh, I found that quite helpful in early music. And I also was able to take it into the genre open improvisations and say, you don't get to play all kinds of material. Just focus on exploring that color or that effect or that playing technique for one round and see what happens. I will not continue for very long, but uh, I should also like to mention the Agnes Patience, which is a uh, exercise I, I learned from Freddy Eichenberger, who is a fantastic keyboardist, lives in Paris, um, where he says, okay, whoever plays the harmonies, plays always four harmonies equal, and then he changes to four other harmonies and they're equal, then he changes again. So he's always moving to a new harmony every four beats. Whoever is improvising always starts on the third beat. And whatever you play, you have to keep across the bar line so that when the harmony changes, you don't change. What you first do then is you hear how does my old note fit in the new harmony, and then you move. In a Baroque style, that usually means that if you are ending up playing a dissonance, you move down, uh, but you can do this in any style. The most important thing is that you have one person who acts and the other person reacts, and they never move at the same time. So I act, you react, I act, you react. It's a very fun exercise too. And again, it has the advantage that um, you're not playing mistakes. So sometimes when the harmony changes, you end up on a note which suits the new harmony. Sometimes you don't. It's a dissonant. But it's, in fact, contrapuntally speaking, it's prepared. You just go down a note and that's the consonants. Uh, and if you do it in a non-tonal setting, which I've done several times, it also works very well. 
because you, uh, you kind of have a distribution of space. First it's you, I'll leave you to, to develop your material. When you're happy with it, you stop. Then it's me. How do I react, react to the material that you gave me? I do my thing and I stop. Then it's you again. So it's a way of culture, or making a culture of giving space and acting and reacting. Let's move on. Expression. I'm, I'm going to spend less time on expression. Uh, it's kind of obvious that, that expression is there and that you can start an improvisation with expression as well. So what I'm basically trying to say, you can start at any point here in this grid. Huh? So I could tell the students, okay, let's start to work on oscillations today. But I can also ask the students, okay, think of an expression, and that's where we start. And we take the material out of that. And one thing I think might work, if you have smaller students or very worried students, who get, then I wouldn't start here. This is the typical like Baroque department thing to do because then you feel clever that you know the four bodily fluids and you know, well, think about something or choleric or sanguine or. Uh, so why don't if if you have a worried student say I don't know how to sound sanguine, you know, I, I, it's it's probably just going to be boring. Well, play something boring. I want your first round of improvisation to be quite boring, in fact. So you take away the, uh, the uh, worry of being boring by letting the student, in fact, try to be boring, which is very difficult. Uh, and if they manage, it's a success. If they don't manage, you can already say, hey, that was not boring. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there must be a lot of experience in this room in how to start with expression as a um, way of improvising. So I'm not going to go a lot into that, but what I can tell you is that it's, for me, becoming increasingly important to move here. Uh, because, especially with early music, what happens a lot is that we indeed uh, focus on the parameters of Franz Spriggen. And they are super worried with pitch. Don't play any wrong notes or misfitting notes. Uh, or we have to stay in, you know, in the tempo. And then we completely forget that we are supposed to express something too. So the only thing we express is kind of being worried and nervous, and, uh, but without trying to do it. So involuntarily nervous. So in my, in my that's, that's not my students, that's me. I, like, I feel like I'm not expressing anything. I'm just, I feel sometimes I'm just thinking or just being nervous or just trying to do, you know, move to the right place. Uh, so recently I've tried to think, okay, what kind of expression is this? What, it doesn't have to be emotions, this is a list of emotions, it can be anything else. Uh, in one case, in this medieval mass that I showed you a snippet of in the beginning, there's a section where we decided, okay, let's go for some kind of stereo effect. We are in this big church and we have two <coughs> sopranos, so because we wanted some kind of, we wanted to use the space and have a stereo effect, that resulted in a different way of doing things. So we had two sopranos singing the canto skirmish instead of two, and we spread them out as much as possible, and we made a mini counterpoint between them where they would sing bam, 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 and my diminutions in the middle would be trying to use the kind of figures that would underscore the use of the room. And because that was not enough for us, we also asked the composer to come in and add electronics and the speakers that were already in the room. Um, so if you are focused enough on expression, you also start to think a little bit outside of the box and say, okay, early music is fun, but it's even more fun if you can have max, max MSP patches and 24 speakers. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to move to form. Uh, and form is something which is going to happen anyway. <coughs> And that goes for all of these um, categories, in a way. What I'm trying to find here are categories that are going to happen anyway. Like you can't avoid having timbre, but you can not think about it. Huh? But it's better to think about it. You can't avoid, you cannot say, yeah, today we're going to play without texture. You have to have, there is going to happen texture, and there's going to be an expression. Even if you don't think about it, you're going to express something. And the same with form. You don't have to plan it, you don't have to improvise it, but at the end, it has a form. Uh, so you just as well might think about it. Um, and what happens in a genre open improvisation is usually I tell my students to 
play a three-minute piece in the first session. Just play something, three minutes, off you go. And usually they do this. And it's quite understandable. You start somewhere and then it develops into something else and then you go back to where you started because we have kind of a sense of the organic. Um, and if we don't work on it, that's what's going to happen all the time. Um, but you can work on it. So of course you can continue with the letters and just add forms like that. Or making a kind of reframe thing with always coming back to the initial, initial material. Which is an interesting thing to do because um, if you don't define the initial material before the improvisation starts, it means whatever the group is improvising in the beginning must be so, let's say, not complex so that they are able to remember it in two minutes from now when they have to repeat it, right? And that becomes kind of a group responsibility. I can't play something, with, something which is so complex that I, we cannot repeat it later today or later in the session. Same goes for this one. I start with something, I repeat, then I play something else. Then I repeat both things, I play something else. You just keep adding to the form. Um, if you have someone from popular music in your group, they all know the verse and refrain and bridge formula, so why not use it? It will not sound the same anyway. Uh, and you can do the same with any known musical form, of course. But what I've had a lot of fun with is poetry. I could give them poems, but I usually don't. Um, does this work? It's going to be outside of the... It almost works. So if you take, for example, a, a sonnet by Petrarch, it has 14 lines. And usually they are what's called antecasyllabic, so they have 11 syllables in each line. If not, they have seven syllables. But usually it's 11, which is the highest form. You can take any poetry, of course. And the sonnet is organized four lines. Four lines. Doesn't work so well, does it? Uh, and then three lines plus three lines. So then already you have a, a quite massive structure consisting of four parts. And the two first parts have four lines and the two last parts have three lines. And then you can work with the number of syllables. I say, okay, let's say that all of them have 11, line, 11 syllables, which means all of them are equally long. But you can also say, let's say 11, 7, 7, 11, 11, 7, 7, 11, mm -hmm. all right? Which means when you have improvised this one, you don't know much about the second line, but you know it's going to be shorter. And you know that the next line is going to be as long as that, and the next line is going to be longer again. And what else can you do? You can use the rhyme structures, which typically could be A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, for example. So then we can explore together what is a rhyme in music. Because a rhyme is not exactly the same, but it's similar, it's recognizable. So, which means whatever you improvise here, if the structure is A, B, B, A, then this A can come back here or it must come back here, which also demands of the group that this A not be more complex that then you are able to remember it when you come here, which, is a, which, could, which could be in a long time from now. And it means that this part must be different from that part. You don't know how yet, but it must be different. Um, so I've tried this several times with my students and it's, it's something that needs practice, but it's fun. And it also, even if the first line is only a minute, all of a sudden you have a, a quarter of an hour with a form, which is a quite long improvisation. Sometimes they forget themselves and they play the first line for two minutes. And they don't realize that this is now all of a sudden a half an hour piece. <laughs> if we are going to keep the structure, let's say, or keep the length of the lines. Um, but it's a way of making a very long improvisation. Uh, where everyone has to make an effort to remember the material that they are making, and which means, again, a mutual responsibility for not making material that you cannot possibly remember. And that, yeah. I'm just <clears throat> curious what you think about how, I mean, this is improvisation, I totally get this, but it's also actually compo composition. Yes. And, and how, that's, yeah, how that relates for you in this context. 
Yeah, well, um, first of all, yes, I agree. And I think, um, as I said in the opening, it's difficult to uh, separate the two processes, comp uh, composing and improvising. And there are a lot of people who use the term comprovisation as describing the process of, let's say, composing through improvising. Um, you could approach this very technically. So if I give 14 lines like this to the, what's it called, GEMA or TONO, you know, the, the authorities that give you money for compositions, they are not going to pay me anything for, for 14 lines with letters on it. Probably not, unless I am as clever as Karin Stockhausen or something like that, <laughs> yeah, promoting it. Uh, but it's kind of a rule-based, it's, what you do is you set up game rules. I like that term very much in improvisation. What you do is you set up game rules. And it's important to remember that, first of all, there are just rules. You can always change them. You made them up yourself. Um, and second of all, we, we always have game rules somehow. There are always some game rules. There are some that are there that are very strong for us, and we don't think a lot about them. But for, for example, if you play a tonal improvisation, we kind of feel obliged to land on some kind of harmonic note on, when, on the change of the harmony. So if I play La Folia in, in G minor, you are going to play in G minor too. <coughs> That's kind of a rule for us. Um, but it's not a composition. Uh, and uh, the, La Folia has a very clear harmonic pattern, much more detailed than this, but I wouldn't call it a composition. Not yet, unless you start to rep you know, repeat the structure so many times and make a piece out of it that you can repeat at each concert. And still it will have elements of improvisation in it. Um, so I don't have a very good answer to you, but I feel that this would be a way of structuring uh, an improvisation. Uh, and it's a structure that I feel is required when you want, let's say, a longer improvisation. It's very, uh, you can't just play for 45 minutes and see what happens. Um, I've done that too, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and you don't have a kind of map or structure in your mind. But it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an approach. Another approach would be, and I'm looking forward to, I think you will talk about it later today, no? Sure. So. Now it is. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it to you. Uh, but uh, once my students did that in the genre open improvisation, um, and what I did was I said, okay, we've been practicing for, for five or six sessions. I want to hear a piece, but I'm not deciding anything. I'm going for a coffee. And I'm coming back in 10, and then I would like to hear a piece which lasts for at least 15 minutes. And so I did, and then I came back, and they didn't tell me anything, and they played, and then they interviewed me afterwards. What did you hear? And it was very funny, because I told them, well, it sounded a bit like, in, in the beginning, it sounded like people were talking in a way, but like everyone at the same time. So I, it was very complex, very messy. And then there start to come kind of a beat to it, a bit groovy in fact, uh, before it went into kind of an ecstasy almost. And then afterwards it sounded like as if you were tired or feeling bad or something. It was just that the expression was definitely kind of tired and, and they just laughed because uh, what they had, their narrative was the Christmas party, which had been the week before. <laughs> uh, starting with conversation in the cantina, going into the dancing and partying, and then the hangover the next day was included in the story. <laughs> so uh, they were very clear in their transmission of uh, expression. But you can think of any narratives, and I'm very curious to see what you will share with us later. Um, as you can see, I've always like, made space for one uh, column here. And if I now try to open the whole grid, uh, I will do precisely what I said we shouldn't do, which is to give too much information, because then it comes, becomes instructional. Uh, so instead of giving too much information, I think I'll reduce it to this, this way of thinking. So materials, whatever you choose it to be, will always happen in combination with textures, expression, and form. And whatever you choose from materials will have an influence on the kind of textures you make, on the kind of expression you make, on the kind of form you can possibly make. The same goes if you start with textures, it will influence the materials. This is white because texture doesn't, it doesn't make sense to say that texture influences texture, but maybe it does. But it's certainly, texture has a kind of 
expressive capacity in itself. And again, form. So you, you get the grid right. Whatever you choose, is, uh, whatever you choose, it influences the other uh, main categories that we are working with. And so my my goal is to empower the students or myself or anyone I'm working with to explore these the contents of these boxes, let's say. Uh, and I will not claim that I always succeed. In fact, uh, one reason I think of this is because I've, have, I've had enough examples in my own life and in my teaching that uh, I or my students or whoever it is feel disempowered or, or unable, uh, which is very discomforting and very dramatic for people, especially classical trained musicians who are so used to preparing well and then shine on the stage. If you ask them to do something that they don't know how to do, and then even put it out there in the public, it can be a very traumatic experience. So it's kind of also, a, for me, it has an ethical dimension uh, when you bring someone into an improvisational practice to make it comfortable for them and for everyone. And as I think you all have noticed, it's also much more rewarding to see or hear a musician that is feeling well than one who is not feeling well. So my most stressful audience moments are usually hearing pianists having exam playing in Bach. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of the most fun experiences I have is to watch uh, or listen to a, a musician exploring something and you can feel the joy of, of discovery. Uh, this was my last slide, but what I'll do for the last two minutes is to open an alternative map. I like maps because this is a little bit too structured in a way for me. And uh, let's leave this and go back to uh, this one. And I'm showing this because I know in the Netherlands a lot of people. Which one is it? I can't read anything. The first one. I know that the research catalog has been quite established, and I use it myself. Oh, I thought I had it open. Oh yeah, there it is. I like to make maps uh, like this. There it is. And the great thing with a map is, uh, this is what I would do on a whiteboard too. I would just write things up, and then you can move it about. And now it's not so important if you think of tools as part of the material, or if indeed you think that the tool is an expression in itself, which I definitely can argue for. Uh, you can put things, you can draw the lines any way you like, you can start any way you like. And it's fascinating how incredibly different shape a project takes depending on where you start, where your main interest is. For a lot of musicians, and indeed the main interest is the, the tool. Let's say you just bought a new instrument. Okay, your next project is going to be about that new instrument, no? Or if you bought some new microphones, your next project is going to be something that you can record with a microphone. Uh, but you can also say, I would love, I like, I listened to this fabulous piece with these shimmering sounds. I would like to do something with shimmering sounds. All right, so which of my instruments will I in fact need mostly for that? And then you start adapting the tools to the kind of texture, or if you like, the kind of expression that you find in shimmering sounds. Someone like uh, Politano, he had asked Meyer uh, destroy, as he said, one of his recorders to be able to play Astro the way he wanted it. So he, he, he voiced the flute so that it would make more... Uh, so, um, yeah, as a final attempt at thinking a little bit differently from what I've been doing for the last hour, here's an up. Uh, I'm glad to share it with you. If there are any questions, I'm very happy to, to uh, reply to them. But if not, I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. I have one short question um, before we finish. Uh, I'm interested in your improvisation of half an hour with your students. That sounds amazing. If you do something like that, um, do you tend to more explain what you want them to do and then let them go? Or is there an element of you conducting or guiding them as they're playing? Uh, I never guide them. So basically, I usually I, I leave the room uh, when they are planning longer improvisations. 
so that they don't get tempted to ask me what I think they should do. Uh, but also we have a build-up. Um, this specific genre open course runs over six weeks. Uh, and I usually start with short improvisation of three minutes. And I, I'm a fan of a motto I heard in Basel once from, they have a free improvisation uh, master degree in, in Basel, not at the Scuola Cantorum, but the, the other part of the academy. And one of the teachers said there that in the beginning of their studies, they teach their students to take the first possible exit. If you see a chance to stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so we practice that, so I say maximum three minutes. And it's shocking how good students or people are at knowing what is three minutes. Especially the bigger the group, the more exact it is. So it's usually like 2.57 and they're not looking at their watch. Three minutes and 10 seconds, it's over. It's really fascinating. But anyways, then we practice exits. And then uh, they grow confidence in, in being able to stop or uh, start new sections. And so we build on that. And in the end, uh, when I say 30 minutes, it doesn't feel like a super long stretch, but something consisting of things they've already done. Yeah. But it didn't happen too often, like not, not every course I do end up with a 30 minutes yeah. uh, improvisation. Yeah. I've, I've gathered that you mostly talk about, um, let's say, high school plus. Yes. And higher, right? Yes. Do you, with kids, will you introduce these elements? Yes. Uh, I haven't worked too much with kids with genre open improvisation in the last 15 years or so. I used to teach in a music school. Um, and I have to say, I found it quite easy to work with improvisation with smaller kids. And then when they enter puberty, things start to get right and wrong and embarrassing. And then it's more difficult to have them do anything. But a six, seven year old, if you ask them to make any kind of sound, they just, you know, they're curious and uh, not embarrassed. Um, and uh, with, uh, but like I don't, I don't always say them say what it is in my head. So I don't say let's work on textures. You know, <laughs> I just say let's make a shimmering sound, and then on top of that something else. Um, so I don't share them, share with them the categories. But that I do in, in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure, I can, I can give it to you as a PDF, maybe. It would be really interesting uh, with the video to get Yes, it. that was going to be my question. Okay. Uh, of course, yeah, that's no problem. Yes? Um, yeah, there's a lot of material and different ideas on what to do, but do you also make an extra category for silence? Ah, and nice. I like it. Well, uh, I think I would put silence in material, <laughs> but but it's, uh, again, silence is so expressive, so I mean, there is a, a very strong correlation or overlap between all the categories, which is why I wanted to make this map too, which doesn't say this belongs here and this belongs here. But yes, absolutely. No, but yeah. it's also connected to what you said about the, uh, trying to find an exit. Yeah. There's lots of the times in, in genre free improvisation, exit is silence and an ending is when it's silence. But that silence is not necessarily the end of something. So mm -hmm. that, or at that, that personally is something that really interests me and it's a difficult one. So. Yeah, but. I agree. Um, silence is, um, usually there's too little silence in the beginning of any kind of improv workshop. If it's historically informed, uh, silence or, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, uh, genre open. Uh, and I think, in a way, it's natural because people want to explore, so they try everything they can, all at the same time. And then at some point you realize that this is a lot of noise. Um, what about silence? You know? uh, and one way of, of creating less activity, if not silence directly, is to ask, well, this I've only done with early music, it would be difficult to do it in a genre, or different to do it in genre, but is to have everyone sing instead of playing. Uh, usually that reduces the activity with, with 90% because people are not able to sing two and a half octaves woo, like uh, all over the place. Uh, but if they sing, they start to sing simple lines and they have to take more breaths. So. But yes, silence is also about giving space for others. Uh, so some of these exercises, including Canon or Argens Patins, is about giving space for other things to happen than yourself. Yeah. Maybe I can add uh, something. Uh, one of my teachers said, uh, which helps very much in group improvisation, he said, always keep your mind 
uh, can I add something, then you do. And if you don't feel you can add something, just be silent. Yeah. It helped me a lot. To, every yeah. time I want to go in, will it be extra or will it just be in the way? Yeah. yeah, 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 very good. I'm going to find, there's one thing in the three plus layers. Because if you tell people to be in the foreground and the background, um, usually or often everyone feels that they should do something all the time. Anyway, I, have, I am the background, I have to be there. I am the foreground, and the soloist. Uh, but I've had some fun experiences with more than three layers. Because I just started to think, is there nothing more than foreground and background? Come on, there must be. Mm -hmm. So we started to make images. For example, imagine you are in the theater, and the protagonist, the foreground person, is in fact in the background, like standing on a mountain, screaming his lament. Uh, so which means you are very expressive and powerful, but you are very silent because you are far in the back. Closer to the audience, you can have a Greek choir, uh, and the Greek choir is just commenting. So they can't be talking all the time. They have to wait what is coming. Ah, okay. Then we comment on that. And then closer, you could have the background, let's say, which now is the foreground. So imagine a landscape painting, and you have this huge landscape. And a bit into the landscape, you have the Greek choir commenting on the person who is far in the back of the landscape. And the fourth layer could be the audience itself, let's say, or, or a veil, which is in front of the stage. So you can just barely see through it. So there could be a shimmering sounds or... We've tried things like that, and that gives people an occasion to take different roles and, and, and then try to make roles that are also silent, that are reacting more than feeding, let's say. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to jump in here and um, say now it's time for a coffee break. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Justine for this fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you.